Good morning, guys. You guys good? Praise the Lord. Hey, Acts, uh, Acts chapter 24, if you got a Bible. My name's Tyler, one of the pastors at Reliance Church. I love Jesus. Love talking about him, love talking to him, love talking with him. So uh, it's great to be here uh, this, uh, this morning. Acts 24, uh, we'll start in uh, verse 22 and read to the end uh, of the chapter. So if you're there, say amen. amen. <laughs> if not, I'm going to go without you. Okay. <laughs> It says this, uh, but when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I'll make a decision on your case. Talking about Paul here. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of, of his friends to provide or visit him. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now, and when I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given to him by Paul that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. But after two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. Hey, so here in this passage, we kind of picked up in the middle. We'll give you some context. But we see a familiar story uh, regarding a situation that Paul often found himself in, uh, in trouble, in jail, uh, standing before his captors. And Luke records for us yet again that Paul does what Paul does. He preaches the gospel. He preaches Jesus. And so this morning, uh, I want to take another look at what we might call Paul's like philosophy of ministry or philosophy of calling or philosophy of missiology, what he was doing when it came to God's calling on his life. I think Luke here, the author of, of Acts, is, uh, is giving us a very specific example for us to learn from in how Paul confronts an unbelieving world. It's kind of an interesting dialogue that Luke records for us. It doesn't really seem to go anywhere or do anything or have anything to do with anything. But I think Luke is recording this for us, this little conversation between Paul and Felix and his wife Drusilla about Paul's intent, about Paul's approach when it comes to confronting an unbelieving world. We have this snapshot of a conversation between probably the greatest evangelist of all time and perhaps some folks that were decidedly outside of God's kingdom, outside of God's family. And I believe the Holy Spirit would have us to kind of take a look and uh, observe God's call to bring the gospel, to bring the message of Jesus to an unbelieving world, a model for us in preaching the gospel. Not certainly the only model. There are thousands of ways to preach the gospel and different methods and approaches that we can take. But I think Luke records this for us to give us insight into Paul's uh, kind of thought process when it comes to his mission to an unbelieving world. I don't usually title messages, but if I were to title this one, it's simply Preach the Gospel. And I would even add an exclamation point at the end of that. Preach the Gospel. This is what Paul is called to do. We'll take a look at Paul's motivation, his approach, and then his subject matter. But for context, we jumped right in the middle. What is even happening here? Paul is arrested. He's brought before Felix, the governor, and his, uh, his charges were, quote, creating dissension among the Jews. He was a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, and he was profaning the temple. Speaking of a time when Paul uh, allegedly brought a Gentile into the temple courts, Luke records for us in Acts 21, and actually tells us that this was a false accusation. So here's Paul falsely arrested, falsely accused, uh, brought uh, in chains as a prisoner before uh, the governor Felix. And here we are. This is, we, this is the context in which we find ourselves. Felix, uh, in the court proceedings, has heard enough. Uh, he doesn't have enough information to make a decision on Paul's case. And so he sends him away and he's going to wait for uh, Lysias, the commander. We don't really know is, 
was he maybe an authority on the case? Did he have more information, maybe a key witness, whatever the case was. But the court proceedings are adjourned. He sends them away. And then we wait. Paul is waiting. And in the meantime, we have this encounter. We have this encounter of Paul brought out before them. And we don't uh, necessarily know why Felix would have brought Paul out, other than he was looking for a bribe from Paul. Felix was probably not a virtuous leader. We know throughout, it's actually secular history, that he was not. Uh, certainly, uh, it would seem that he was just looking for entertainment. Uh, he wasn't necessarily looking for the gospel. <laughs> he wasn't looking for Jesus. He wasn't looking to be confronted with his sin. He was looking to be entertained. And Felix brings this guy out. Whatever the case is, certainly we can assume that Felix and Drusilla would have never heard the words of the gospel in any other context. They would have never attended Paul's sermons. <laughs> they would have never attended the synagogues or the temples or where Paul was preaching the gospel in the house churches in that region. They would have never set foot in those. And here is God in his providence and in his working and in his mission, formulating and moving, creating this situation to present to them the message that they needed to hear. And Paul was willing to take part in that. And so right off the bat, I mean, I need to take a look and say, what is God doing in our region? What is God doing in our world? What's God doing in my context that I'm saying no to, <laughs> that I don't want to be a part of because it's uncomfortable or it doesn't make sense? Here's Paul in a, in a position that wouldn't make sense, that would make him angry or upset. And yet he's willing to be used by the Lord to proclaim the gospel to people that otherwise would never have heard these words. Paul, the willing vessel. And so in comes Paul in a position here of apparent obvious disadvantage. He's the captive. He's the weak one. He's feeble. He has no defense. He's standing before the ones who would decide his fate, even decide his death or life. He's the one that's stressed. He's the one that has nothing going for him. He's standing before his captors, Felix and Drusilla, in the positions of apparent power. They're the ones in charge. They're the ones ruling over him. They're the ones that have the authority. They're the ones that have the strength and power. Felix is in charge. Now, in this context and in this situation, this is often how we find ourselves when we approach presenting the gospel to an unbelieving world. I'm, I'm weak. I'm feeble. I'm frail. I don't have any authority to stand on. I don't know what to say. I don't know how this is going to work out. The world, by the world standards, they're the ones in charge. They're the ones making the rules. They're the ones with the power structures all around us. By the world standards, the church or even Christians individually are the weak ones, are the foolish ones, are the ones that we don't listen to, are the ones that we put down and put away and are frail. They have no authority, spiritual or otherwise. And by the world standards, that's true. <laughs> they're right. <laughs> If you, if, you hold, if you look at the world standards, yeah, you look at the church and the church has no authority. The church uh, shouldn't be the ones in charge or exerting anything over the world, but that's not the way God's kingdom works. I think sometimes we feel like that when it comes to preaching the gospel. I'm beat down. I'm in captivity. I'm struggling. I'm weak. I'm foolish. I don't have anything to say. I don't know how this is going to go. I'm not in a position to say anything. And this is the lie that can be fed to us by the enemy time and time again. And eventually, sometimes we, get, we start to feel like that, right? We start to believe that. Confused and fearful in a state of feeling weak and tired and exhausted. We say the world has the power. The enemy has the power. Hey, may, maybe nothing's going to change. Maybe really nothing is going to get better. Maybe I, I don't have anything to say into this. Is God in charge after all? What even is happening here in our world? You look out and you start to wonder and, and think these things. Maybe it's time to just give up. Well, we don't give up. Maybe it's time to just take a step back. Maybe it's time to just be quiet and just kind of wait. Let's just wait till the end. Jesus will come back. He'll make everything good. And then, and then everything will be okay. And we kind of lose sight a little bit of this mission that we've been given the rich, powerful, influential, successful, bored Roman governor <laughs> and his wife before this weakened, failed prisoner apostle. And in that moment, God opens a door. 
God opens this door for the weak and defeated apostle to preach. And man, look at his sermon. Like, he preaches. <laughs> he doesn't hold back. He doesn't hold any punches. It's this open door for this couple to hear what God would have for them. And I mean, you think about this. Like, what would my strategy be in this situation? <laughs> like, for reals. You know, I'm, I'm held captive and I'm coming before Felix and I'm thinking like, hey, you know, I got to play my cards right here. Like, if, if I do this right, maybe strike up a friendship I don't want to push them away too soon or, you know, I, I want to preach the gospel, but let's, let's play this out. Maybe I strike up a friendship and cultivate a relationship, maybe tell a few jokes, maybe get on their level, get them to like me. And then maybe after a few months of this, you know, I can kind of bring up God and just kind of vague and ambiguous and see how they take it, see how they like it. And then maybe if they, if they still are open to that, then maybe kind of lead into a conversation about Jesus and God's love and kind of see how that goes. And then if they're still interested, maybe I'll still, you know, maybe think about praying about how I could bring up a conversation about sin and then kind of see how it goes. And then, you know, how they, fair enough. And sometimes that, that's the case. We want to do that through relational ministry and all of these things. That could be a strategy. Maybe Paul's thinking, hey, I've got to convince them to let me go. Like, I've, I've got a mission of, uh, by God. I'm supposed to be, you know, preaching to the Gentiles. I'm supposed to be planting churches. This is the mission that God's called me to. I'm, I'm, more, I'm worth more to God out there than I am in here in this situation. So I've got to get out of here. Maybe I can bribe him. Maybe I can get on his good side. I won't talk about the gospel at all. That's going to push him away. Maybe, fair enough, that's a valid strategy perhaps. But no, Paul is straightforward. He's earnest and direct, direct in how he brings the gospel to people who need to hear it. So Paul's motivation. Number one, uh, one way to, to note motivation uh, in people is by observing their actions in uncomfortable situations. So when things aren't going well, when things don't go to plan, those actions are a good picture, a good insight into our motivations. What is truly motivating us? If Paul were truly concerned about self-preservation, if Paul were concerned about uh, you know, fear of the future, if he were only interested in a friendship, if he were only interested in getting out of prison to carry on with his life, there is no way in the world that he would preach this sermon that he preaches to Felix and Drusilla. This is something that, uh, there's something else within Paul that brought him to a place of obedience. And he explains it. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse four, he says, for we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose, our purpose, his purpose is to please God, not men. This is what motivated him, approved by God, purchased by the grace of God, brought him from darkness to light, from death to life, from a legalistic Pharisee and murderer to a compassionate and gentle messenger of God's good news. And look who he aims to please. It's God, not men. I think a lot of times, you know, the church tries to do both. You know, how can we make things comfortable? Uh, how can we please men? How can we make this more palatable? How can we make this more approachable? And that's, that's fine, you know, objectives to have. But when we lose sight of this phrase that Paul says, our purpose is to please God, not men, that is, the, that is the purpose. That is the motivation in preaching the gospel. The gospel is offensive. It's offensive to the world systems. It's offensive to sinners. It's offensive to selfish people, to pride. It's offensive to the world. But Paul was motivated by grace to please God the grace giver. This was his mission, and that's it. He writes to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. <laughs> that was his motivation. In his second letter to the Corinthians, he says, hey, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men because the fear of the Lord is what motivates us. It's what compels us. He continues a few verses later. He says, for the love of Christ compels us. Because Jesus loved me, because we fear the Lord, I must go about my mission. And finally, he ends 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. He says, now we're ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, it's one thing for Paul to write those words. It's another thing for him to live it out. And so here he is in an uncomfortable situation. What's Paul going to do? 
How, Paul, are you going to approach this? Are you going to please God? Are you going to preach the gospel? Are you going to truly live in the fear of the Lord and try to persuade men? Is it really the love of Christ that compels you to do, to say what you're going to say? You call yourself an ambassador. Does that include an ambassador to Felix, your captor, the one who's going to decide your fate? How are you going to react, Paul? Paul had this rock-solid foundation of truth that motivated him to do things that don't make worldly sense. (laughs) Can we say the same? What motivates us today in preaching the gospel? Have you experienced the goodness of God that we just sang about? Have we stood in awe of God's indescribable character, of his indescribable actions, knowing the awe of his glory and standing before him in the fear of the Lord? Is that what compels us? Do we understand the love of Christ? Does that compel us to preach the gospel to anyone and everyone before us? What, provi- what drives us to persuade men? Neighbors, co-workers, friends, and family. Can we be persuasive in that way? Persuasion and imploring is unfashionable, isn't it? Don't encroach. Keep your opinions to yourself. Don't shove that down anyone's throat. Just live your life and be quiet, the world would say. This is unfashionable in our culture. Listen, our purpose is to please God, not men. Paul's approach, well, (laughs) he spoke. (laughs) words he spoke to Felix in verse 24 we just read then Felix heard him concerning faith in Jesus how could Felix hear him of course Paul is using words in verse 25 it says Paul reasoned about uh, righteousness and self-control and the judgment to come in Greek the word reasons means to discuss to talk to have a discourse, a dialogue, uh, to speak or to preach even. Is that, what word, uh, that uh, what that word can mean in the Greek? Paul was going about his gospel ministry the only way he knew how, by talking, by talking about it. We say, well, I, I can't do that. I can't, I can't preach. I can't get up there. I don't have eloquent words. Okay, then don't preach. Discuss. <laughs> well, I, I don't know how to do well, Okay, then talk. <laughs> we know how to talk. <laughs> Say words. Use what God has given us. What words? What words do I say? Any words. <laughs> Any words about the goodness of God, about the grace and truth and love and judgment and sin and righteousness and redemption and the, the mercy that God shows us and the hope of eternal life and the future to come and the redemption and the goodness and the, all of it. Use any words to talk about the mission of God. Listen to how Paul speaks of his own speaking. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, So it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I didn't come with eloquence of human wisdom as I proclaimed the testimony about God. For I resolved, meaning I chose, I made a decision, Paul says, to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. It might be preferred if you don't know what to say. (laughs) It might be preferred if you're fearful or trembling, like Paul says. We say, I don't have the boldness or the courage or the confidence to just tell people the gospel. Paul's like, great, me too. (laughs) Fear and trembling is is, is the emotions that overcame weakness. I love everything about this message or this passage from Paul, but... Note especially that emphasis on Jesus over himself. If our, if our approach is going to be grounded in the proclamation, the verbal proclamation of the gospel, it must be done without any cloud of our own power, of our own wisdom, of our own strength, of our own perceived greatness. Paul understood this. The power solely rests on the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul certainly could have preached with eloquence of words, Paul was a brilliant scholar. Like he was schooled. He was up there with the great Greek philosophers and teachers of the time. He could have, he was trained, he was persuasive, but he chose to put the emphasis of his preaching on Jesus and him crucified. That was his approach. Was it what the listeners wanted to hear? Nope. (laughs) Was it it, uh, palatable? Nope. Was it popular? Nope. But was it powerful? Man, absolutely. That's the powerful message of the gospel. 
because his preaching was a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul's in a situation where it would probably do him good to be quiet. It would probably do him good to keep his mouth shut. Maybe Paul could just demonstrate God's love to Felix and Drusilla. Maybe he could just be a nice guy. Maybe he could just, you know, uh, I don't know, make it more palatable to just demonstrate the, the goodness of God in his life. And then they could ask him about it. And then maybe later he could speak about the gospel. But Paul doesn't do that. I got to be honest, that thought runs through my head a lot. In, in kind of reading through this, and that, that's the conviction for me. Um, you know, maybe, maybe God has called someone else to preach to Felix and Drusilla. I, I'm, just here, I'm just here to be nice. I'm just here to kind of show God's love and just go along with the flow and just let, let someone else kind of take that, take that role. Uh, maybe the situation isn't going to work out. Maybe, maybe this is a little uncomfortable and, hey, you know, I, I can be a good Christian and, and just kind of, you know, be a nice guy. Paul knew if he were going to confront unbelievers with the gospel, it was going to be done through spoken words. That was his approach. Do we hold the same conviction? Sometimes my approach is to utilize any other tool <laughs> except spoken words. I'll use social media, I'll use written words, I'll use uh, my actions, I'll use my reactions, I'll use whatever else except just speaking about the gospel. Now, come on, to be clear, absolutely, the gospel can be demonstrated. The gospel has to be lived out. The gospel can be displayed to the world in all kinds of ways. Many times it might even be better to a simple gospel-centered action can speak volumes over a 10-minute preaching in someone's face. Absolutely. But do we understand the importance in the early church, in Paul's message, in Paul's mission to speak the words of his testimony. So we got Paul's motivation, we got Paul's approach, and then thirdly, his subject matter. What did he actually talk about? What did he actually say? Luke tells us that he begins with his talking about his faith in Jesus and a great topic. What a great, brilliant opening statement to this conversation. What's your faith like? What is your faith in? Why do you have faith? In whom do you have faith? What impact has your faith had on your life? How has this changed you? How has this impacted you? How has this affected you? But further, Luke tells us that Paul gives a three-point sermon. <laughs> Righteousness, self-control, and judgment. Let's look at those real quick because these are incredible points for Paul to talk about. Now, no doubt, talking about righteousness, Paul would have spoken about God's holiness, he would have spoken about God's love for righteousness, how before a holy God, mankind is found in no other state than sinful, unholy, and unrighteous. What a contrast from the words of the world in our culture. Our culture says man is good, man is divine, man's got that spark. Just follow your heart, do what you want because whatever, your light shines in the darkness or whatever, you know, garbage is spilled out there, some other weird thing. Paul, probably his Old Testament scholar, would have come out in Psalm 11. He says, the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Not just anyone, not just those who are okay, not just those who do good things, the righteous. Psalm 45, Paul might have quoted, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Remember who he's talking to, Felix and Drusilla. And then he goes to self-control. He talks about self-control. You go from talking about the righteousness of God and the wickedness of man to then talking about self-control. The word deals with the control of fleshly passions, lusts, and evil desires. Maybe he would have quoted from Proverbs chapter 25. A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Or maybe he would have repeated his words to Timothy. He, he said this to Timothy. In the last days, people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, and without self-control. In a stark contrast, of course, to the world's ways. What does the world say? Do whatever you want. Do whatever makes you happy. Do whatever your heart desires. Total and complete bound, boundless freedom to follow every desire. 
that's our mission. That's what you should do. That's what you should go after. That's what will make me happy. Self-control, Paul talks about. And again, think about his listeners. Felix, secular history tells us that Felix was born actually in low estate and through bribery and trickery and fraud uh, and, and um you know, debauchery and greed. He actually worked himself into this position of governor. He was not a good man. <laughs> he was not a poster boy for self-control. Uh, Drusilla, uh, it says, was married a few times, actually. Ended up, again, through uh, kind of, you know, underhanded tactics, ends up as the governor's wife. This would not be the couple to talk about righteousness and self-control to. Yet here is what Paul is doing, declaring the wickedness of man's heart, exposure of sin, and then his third point, (laughs) judgment to come. Paul, what are you doing? The eternal state of our souls and the ultimate need for a savior. He says, God is just. God is right. He will not allow the evil of sin to abide forever. Maybe Paul would have quoted from Job 37. As for the Almighty, he is excellent in judgment and abundant justice. Maybe he would have quoted from Ecclesiastes. For God will bring every work into judgment, Felix and Drusilla, including every secret thing. Everything that you don't know about or that you don't think anyone else knows about. Maybe Psalm 76, Paul would have said, God arose to judgment to deliver all the oppressed of the earth. All those people, Felix, that you stepped over. All those people, Felix, that you put to death. All those people that you put down and oppress, God will arise to judgment. Here's Paul conversing about his faith in Christ, his testimony, and he talks about these three things, righteousness, self-control, and judgment. Why? What about God's love? What about God's mercy and his grace? What about those comfortable things that make us happy? Why such offensive subject matter, Paul? Because the world needs to hear it. Because we need to hear it. Because I need to be reminded of God's righteousness and his desire for righteousness. Because I need to be reminded of self-control as a fruit of the Spirit. Because I need to be reminded that my flesh doesn't dictate what I get to do and what I want and what I drive for and what burdens me. Because I need to be reminded that God is a just judge. That God is uh, right and upright and just and doesn't allow evil to abide and go on forever. I need to hear the words of the gospel. Paul's using the word of God to get to the heart of the matter because I can't come to Christ without first seeing my need for Christ. The world will never come to Christ if they don't first see their need for Christ, if they don't first see their need for a savior. I said the title of the message is preach the gospel, but don't forget to preach it to yourself. Don't forget to put ourselves in a position of needing Jesus' salvation day to day. Yes, we are saved once, but yes, we are continually being saved. As God works in us and molds us and sanctifies us and shapes us. We love love the other part of the gospel. (laughs) The hope of eternal life, the, the goodness of God, the love of Jesus that makes everything right. But sometimes we lose sight of righteousness and self control and judgment. I need to preach this to myself all of the time. Were the gospel, were the gospel never about conviction of sin, then Jesus hasn't come to make me a new creation. He's come for some other reason. A- any other reason, really. If, if the gospel is not about conviction of sin and making me right, then Jesus has never come to make me a new creation. But that is not the gospel. That's not the gospel of the cross. That's not the gospel of Jesus. The gospel of Jesus is the Holy Spirit cutting to the heart, cutting to the heart of men, cutting to the heart of Felix, cutting to the heart of Drusilla, cutting to the heart of Paul. It's cutting to the heart of the the stubborn Pharisees in Acts chapter 8. It's cutting to the heart of John and his followers as he preached Jesus out in the wilderness, telling people to repent and to seek God. It's the Holy Spirit cutting to our hearts, reminding us yet again of our need for the mercy and grace of God. That's the gospel. C.S. Lewis said, no man knows how bad he is until he's tried very hard to be good. (laughs) And if you've tried very hard to be good, you start to realize and understand just how bad you are. 
The world tries to be good. People try to be good. But it's in those moments that we need a Savior. Luke says the conclusion of the deal, Felix was afraid. An interesting response. He was troubled or alarmed. And rightly so. Something in him probably knew that Paul was correct. That this was true. Now it's interesting though that Luke records for us that we don't really see if Felix or Drusilla accepted the gospel. It would seem that they didn't. He sent them away. Yes, yes, they conversed often, and so he did bring them back out, but he was hoping for a bribe, Luke says. Secular history tells us that, uh, that Drusilla uh, died, actually, in the city of Pompeii, in the volcanic eruption of Mount Vesuvius, known for its debauchery and partying atmosphere. It would seem that Felix and Drusilla never accepted the gospel, the outcome of this situation that Luke records for us doesn't seem to go well. It doesn't seem to be a success. What's the point? Luke is saying it doesn't matter what the outcome is. You concern yourself with pleasing God, not men. You concern yourself with preaching the gospel. You concern yourself with proclaiming the righteousness of God and the self-control that we're called to and the judgment to come and the salvation that Jesus offers. Certainly Paul would have had abundant opportunity to talk about the beauty of Jesus's grace and love. And no, no doubt Paul took that opportunity because in the ultimate wickedness of our hearts, there steps a savior king so loving and compassionate that it changed Paul from murderer to evangelist. And that's what compelled him, that while he was still a sinner, Christ died for him. And so he's going to preach that message. Christ died for Paul Christ died for Felix and Drusilla. Christ died for me. Christ died for you to take our unrighteousness, to take our lack of self-control, to take our disregard for the judgment to come that we deserve. And then he turns it around and cleanses us, makes us sons and daughters, presented us spotless to the Father that God has come to save the world. It's that gospel that we're called to preach. It's that gospel that we're called to preach with an exclamation point at the end. It's that gospel that we're called to live out and display and to talk about with words. This is Paul's motivation. This is Paul's approach and this is Paul's subject matter. Let's make a point to make it ours as well. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for this group of guys. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the opportunity to talk. I thank you for the the, the, the place that you've provided. I thank you for the, the mission that you've given us, God. And I thank you that you've given to each man different gifts and different uh, personalities. Lord, but the message remains the same, God. We want to talk about your gospel. And so we thank you, Lord, that this that we have here in front of us is a model of presenting the gospel. It's not the model. It's not the only way. But God, I pray that we would take a walk with this and, and learn and, and, and think and, and maybe make some changes, God, in how we approach the mission that you've set before us. And would we work together, Lord, and would we uh, ste step, into, step into your mission, God, step into what you would want for our lives and what you would want for the unbelieving world around us. God, help us to be in tune with you. Help us to know your will. Help us to follow you in all things. And in these uncomfortable situations, God, may our motivation be to please you and not men. May our approach be to talk boldly with courage, knowing that the power is from the Holy Spirit, not from our own brilliance. And God, may we just be okay <laughs> with you doing your thing. So God, we, we give you this time. We ask that you'd go before us, use us, speak to us, fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we might please you rather than men. God, we love you. We thank you for loving us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.